the world's, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Ian Rankin. Uh, I've been with the Edinburgh International Book Festival basically since day one. I went as a student, as a reader, as a fan of writing. Uh, later on, I was invited to go as an author, which was a thrill. And it's a spectacular experience. It's a meeting of minds. It's a way to open your mind to new experiences, to new ideas, nuanced debate, entertainment, something for every age group. And that's what keeps me going back year after year after year. Long may it continue. Hello and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. I am Natalie Carter, the co-founder of Black Girls Book Club, and I'm here with my other co-founder, Melissa cummings Quarry, and New York Times best-selling author, Britt Bennett. Thank you for joining us, and many thanks to University of Edinburgh for sponsoring the festival this year. So, Britt, thank you so much for joining us. We're here, we are so excited to talk about The Vanishing Half, probably a little bit over excited. Um, <laughs> this is um, a brilliant book. For those people who haven't read it, we will try our best not to do spoilers, even though we are known for spoilers. But um, Britt, do you want to just go ahead and have a talk about the book, of the inspiration behind it, and kind of what the thought process was? Uh, sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, thanks, everybody, for watching. Um, you know, the inspiration behind the book was just a conversation I had with my mom about a town that she remembered hearing about when she was a child growing up in, in rural Louisiana. Um, and I just wanted to kind of think about what it would be like to live in a town like this, which is a town just obsessed with skin color and lightness. Um, and thinking about these characters who come from this town, one who returns to the town and one who leaves it and they go their separate ways. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean... For, for me, to kind of just reading the book, one thing that I noticed and kind of thought about in my own kind of Jamaican heritage is the idea that you do kind of have those families who are very kind of much, we are this complexion and we marry and we interact with the same complexion and that's how it stays. And so I think the subject matter, even though you're talking about a time in Louisiana, it has so much impact and relevance of people from the diaspora across the world who probably do know about those kind of communities where people are very kind of like, this is my complexion, this is who I married, this is kind of the lane that I stay in, especially kind of with the impact that colorism still has today as effectively the color, the cousin, I would say, of racism. So you have this conversation with your mom about this town and then you create these twin sisters 
to effectively run away. Do you kind of want to, I know you don't want to give too much about the book, but kind of where did the idea of the twins come into it and how did you think about, how did you develop that when you were coming to tell the story about the obsession about skin colour and alternative, effectively the obsession with race? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I knew that the town was uh, the jumping off point for me, um, but I knew that the town was not a novel, it was just a setting. So I wanted to think about uh, these twins who, who live their lives in completely different directions, who come from this town um, and come from this obsession with color. One who um, ends up sort of following that obsession to its kind of logical ending point where she actually becomes white and one who rejects it completely and returns to this town with her dark skinned child. Um, so I think, you know, for me, a lot of this book was about trying to think about colorism in a way that didn't feel abstract, in a way that yeah. felt uh, concrete and, and real and embodied. And uh, part of my, my way of doing that, I think, was, was basing it in this town and thinking about these characters who come from this town but react to the ideology in two very different ways. So I wanted yeah. to ask you, in terms of the character of Stella, so Stella is the twin that decides that she wants to go on to become white. And I think with her character, there's like a scene in the book where they're at the housing association and they're you know, all complaining because a black family are going to move into the neighbourhood. And effectively, oh, she, yeah. she becomes a Karen. Like, so how did, and she's, how it's kind of described as usually she's really quiet, she doesn't really say much. And even her husband is surprised and all the people in the neighborhood are surprised by her reaction to this black family. And I don't know why, but I thought that she would kind of say something positive and say, you know, be quite welcoming of them. And her reaction <laughs> surprised me. And when I kind of saw that reaction, I thought, okay, I understand where the book is going now. So how did you kind of curate that character? And was that intentional for her to be kind of, it's kind of similar to that article that you wrote about, you know, good white people, but is it was that intentional that she was that person and she kind of really threw off any kind of indication that she was black? Was that intentional? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, when you read about passing, you know, sometimes there are people who, uh, who pass sort of from time to time, you know, I'm passing because I want to get this job or I'm passing because I want to um, have, you know, make more money or these sort of temporary things. And then they eventually return to their community, they return to their family, they have kind of one foot in one life, one foot in another. Um, I knew that Stella was not going to be that eventually. I knew that she was going to be someone who would pass completely, I'm shutting that door behind me and I'm kind of not looking back or, or I'm trying my best not to look back. Um, and because of that, I wanted that moment where you see her again to be really surprising. Um, I wanted it to be striking where you see her sort of full-throated commitment to this new life that she's chosen to live in. Um, and I think Stella is, she has this kind of um, almost sort of fight or flight the entire time where she is uh, constantly feeling under duress and she's constantly worried about being discovered. So the idea of this black family moving in across the street is an existential threat to her. I can't lie, I really thought that when she, I think it was Loretta, I think the name of the family right next yeah. to the friend that she, that she made, I really thought that she was gonna at least give something away, like even with the cake that she was making, for some reason I thought it was gonna be cornbread or just something that that woman, would, I don't know why, I was just reading it, I thought she's gonna do something, like she's gonna cook rice and peas or just cook something that that woman's gonna eat it and say, sis, like, I see you. And, you know, but you know, I don't know. You are a water. This is, that's just what I thought. So I just had this idea. It's like she really plays the game all the way through, even when she kind of tells her daughter, like, don't play with that, that girl, yeah. you know, the, the N word. And there's no point where she even says to her daughter, don't say that word. And then the daughter says it to the girl. And obviously there's this kind of big um, issue, um, which there should be really. But it was just, it's just the way she completely embraced the character of being white. And I don't know, I guess you have to commit to it. When you decide that you want to pass, you commit to passing and kind of throwing away anything to do with your past life. But it's just such a difference to the way in which her sister, in fact, embraces yeah. She marries the darkest man she can find. She ensures she moves back to her hometown, you know, and even knowing that she's kind of quite white as well, she never, she never decides to even pass she, there's never an idea or inkling that she should pass and was that intentional as well kind of having the Desiree not wanting to pass or not even thinking about passing and just seeing herself as a black woman through and through yeah I mean I think you know Desiree is somebody who is I think would be fine with that sort of momentary passing she's the one who encourages Stella to to pass when she gets yeah. a new job 
Yeah. Um, so that idea of passing to sort of opportunistically from moment to moment, that's something that she thinks is quite funny and is sort of encouraging and egging on. Um, so I don't think that she, you know, to me that's less about any type of racial pride and more just about, um, I think Desiree is somebody who feels a deep sense of loyalty. Um, I think that she's somebody that would not be able to leave her family behind and just kind of walk away in the way that Stella um, does. Um, so I think that that she had kind of has more that's anchoring her, I think, to, to her family and to Mallard than Stella. Or she, if she sort of, Stella has this kind of uh, drive to go her own way um, in a way that I don't think Desiree necessarily feels, or at least doesn't feel strongly. She thinks that she feels it, but I think that she doesn't actually want to live apart from her sister. Yeah, I think that's interesting because aside from the passing, you just have that abandonment that one minute your sister's there and you're in this together and next minute my girl has just left, cleared off, like clean, gone. And oh, you, don't hear, her. you know, you, you don't hear from her even after you kind of had this plan to run away and create this new new life for yourself. That kind of, um, I, did, I, I, I did really kind of feel that sadness and kind of that um, abandonment even... So it doesn't seem like there's any kind of guilt on Stella's part about it. She's just like, oof. It's kind of, I, I thought that was quite interesting. But separately, I know that kind of there's been like um, a TV deal that's been agreed and things like that. And um, that is really, really exciting. Um, how are you kind of thinking in terms of how the story will be told? Are there any things that you're kind of particular about making sure the characters are represented in a particular way to make sure that the message that was in that book about the obsession about colorism and skin color isn't diluted once the book makes it from our shelves onto our big screens? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I am not writing it. So um, I am handing the book off to somebody who is, knows what they're doing about how to write for TV. Um, so a lot of choices about the show will be made by this writer, although I'm able to consult and I'm hoping to talk to whoever we bring in and, and, and offer uh, my insight on, on what the show might be. Uh, but I think that appropriate casting is uh, necessary um, yeah. for this project. Um, so that's going to be something that feels very down the road, you know, at this point, because uh, we don't have a writer yet, let alone a script, let alone a cast. Um, but that's something we've definitely had conversations about, um, about appropriate casting for all the characters, about the twins, about Reese, um, about their daughters, um, making sure that we find the right actors for the role um, to represent them in the way that they're represented in the book. Um, so that's something that, that matters to us a lot. And I think really the, the most, most of the conversations we've had have just been about maintaining the spirit of the book, even if yeah. the, the show, um, you know, looks different or, or is structured differently, um, just maintaining the spirit of the book and maintaining the, the nuance in the story. Uh, I think those are our biggest priorities. Do you have a dream cast? Like who would you want the twins to be? If you ah, have yeah. <laughs> I don't have a dream cast. Um, and uh, you know, I, I know that there are writers who think about this when they're writing. I don't, I don't, really envision actors at all when I'm writing. Um, so I never once thought about it. Um, and I get tagged sometimes in people's suggestions as they've been campaigning. Um, there's been a lot of campaigning for Meghan Markle, actually. Um, so <laughs> there's been a shadow campaign waged on, um, okay. on Twitter for Meghan Markle, which is, that's, the, that's like the funniest timeline that somehow she decides you know, she wants to, <laughs> she wants to step into this. Yeah, somehow she is compelled to do yeah. that. Somebody was campaigning for Mariah Carey. Um, so, <laughs> so that's, that's pretty hilarious. Like all these, these names, but anyways, I, you know, I'm, I know that HBO, they make great TV. Um, everybody wants to work with them. So I'm certain that they will find great actors for these roles. Um, but I don't have any, I don't have any, favorites in mind I'm mostly excited actually to find the writer I think that that's mm -hmm. the process that I'm most excited about of sort of taking something that existed in my brain alone and, and handing it to someone else and allowing them to transform it into something new if I feel like I'd be really possessive like if I've created something that's incredible and things everyone's told you it's incredible as well whoever yeah. steps into your shoes 
has got to do a damn good job because every, <laughs> damn good yeah, job. We'll angry, we'll all get angry and we won't be in front of <laughs> But I just feel like whoever does this, you just know that that person's really got to love the story and understand it as well. And it's important. There's so much like layers and it's very complex in terms of passing and black culture and black history as well. You need to understand that, I think, to even read a book like this and get it more than surface level. But I was just thinking like, who would I have as like early? For some reason, I'm obsessed with early, even yeah. though he's like predominantly featured, but something about him, my heart just, I just, my spirit took to him. Like I'm just... <laughs> I think you know, he, he, he reminded me of tea cake a little bit. He had a lot. Oh, of yes. Tea he, cake. he was tea my tea cake vibe. He was my yeah. tea cake vibe, but he just didn't seem to be like a gambler and a thief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, tea, tea, tea cake could have been. He could have been. <laughs> For those that don't know, tea cake is one of the love interests in their eyes are watching God. Um, For those yeah. who don't know. Know, but yeah he had that mm, kind of cool it's, kind of yeah, something there's just something about him for it I love the way you you kind of wrote that so it'd be really exciting to see who they pick I feel like it'll be like Michael Ely or someone like that but it should be really oh. interesting it needs to be so I feel like it'd be Michael Ely <laughs> they bring Michael Ely and you just because he, just because he has a raspy voice like the their eyes watching God they did like a film version Halle Berry was like that. She was Janie when Janie was like 16 and when Janie was like 40 as well. But Michael Ely was um, tea cake. And to be fair, he took the role really well. I think he was well. <laughs> just, just offering my opinion. <laughs> um, one of the relationships that I found was really interesting was the relationship. Well, it's not really a relationship, but the, yeah, it was. Like, between like Jude and um, Kennedy, because it's like every time they were on the page together, like my heart was just jumping. Like, when are we gonna get to? Like, when are the dots gonna start kind of being put together? Like, when are we going to to? When is a clue going to be given to Kennedy to kind of get her there? Like, you tortured us on purpose. I'm sure that was your plan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I uh, I knew that I was writing towards these cousins eventually meeting um, in some way. Um, and, you know, it was interesting because Jude, there's like this huge information imbalance. Like Jude yeah. has access to way more information than Kennedy does. So Kennedy is just kind of blithely unaware. She's like bumbling about her, you know, spoiled sort of Brentwood life. And then Jude, you know, knows who Kennedy is and she knows about Stella and she knows all that information. Um, so I, I, you know, I wanted to think about what these characters were going to be like in a room together. Uh, what their dynamic was going to be. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I wanted to, you know, apply the tension of it, but also just think about what type of relationship would they form? You know, would these yeah. two people be friends in a vacuum? Um, the idea of the two of them kind of hanging out was always something that I wanted to write towards and, and then play with once I got there. Yeah. It's be based on anyone because she was a bit too well written. It was so specific. <laughs> like, she was annoying as hell. That's yeah, why. She, she's the one that everybody kind of hates. <laughs> I think that she's the character everyone kind of hates. Um, you know, I actually like Kennedy a lot. I had fun writing her. Um, and no, she's not really based on anyone, but uh, I think her voice is so much fun. There's just this kind of chattiness to it. Mm -hmm. Sort of this, there's a kinetic energy to her, which is very different than Stella, who's very kind of still. Yeah. Um, so there's just constant, constant movement and motion in her. Um, and I think that there's so many contradictions within her, uh, this really with Kennedy, what I kept thinking about was, you know, you have these people who do DNA tests and they do 23andMe or whatever, and their whole life they believe themselves to be one race and they find yeah. out that they're another one. Yeah. And there are some people who like, it changes everything about their life. It, you know, it totally uh you know rewrites the whole way that they've thought of themselves and the narrative that they've surrounded and then there are other people who just kind of ignore it you know they suppress it um and they sort of refuse to accept it as anything that is actually consequential um and i don't think either approach is right or wrong i just find both of those very interesting of what would i do if i somehow did a dna test and it was like surprise you're not actually black and i'm thinking Woo! well these are all the things that i've lived in my life so far and this is all the ways that I've you know shaped how I thought and you know that type of thing you know it's a it's like a really sort of kind of earth-shattering thought and let alone for Kennedy who learns that she is not 
white or maybe not not quite oh, completely white. white yeah not completely white in the way that she thinks herself to be um which nobody is but not completely white in the way that she's always believed herself to be um so for her to learn that and then what does that change about her there's a way in which i think i kept thinking about what what type of emotional response you would have to that type of information is it something that suddenly now she wants to go learn about black history you know like she never struck me as that type of person who would be like let me use this as an opportunity to like <laughs> i was just like no that i don't think that's going to be her reaction but that's like one path somebody could go on um but i think that that was the question to me was like discovering something about yourself or about your family about your past does it change you at all or or is it something that you just sort of reject as irrelevant to the person that you are I think when I was reading it, I just thought everybody in the town of Mallard effectively could pass for white if they wanted to. And they all chose not to. And I just think if someone came to me and said, Melissa, you're white, I can't lie, I wouldn't tell anybody. I'm the whole co-founder. You wouldn't of tell me. I'll just continue. <laughs> I would not wow. say anything. If, and as much as I kind of live my life just being me, I am a black woman, whatever that means. I don't know what it means, but if you were to take that away from me, I wouldn't let you. It'll be a tug of war. I just, I just don't think I would want want that. So I don't. So for me, it's like so hard to kind of. Oh, I understand why Stella did it. It makes sense. 100%. But to live her life that way and to not tell her children, her husband didn't know because when we read um, Nana Larson's passing, her husband that clearly had an idea because he called her Nick. You know, he, there's little references yeah. to her skin and whatnot that kind of. Let's, that it's clear that he slightly knew, but he chose to just ignore that. But with um, Stella's husband, Blake, he doesn't notice a thing about her. So for me, like the question, what does it mean to be white? What, what does that mean? What is whiteness? Was something that kind of permeated completely through the book. Because Jude doesn't believe herself to be anything near to white because she's so dark. She, she can't even, even put the two together. But someone like Kennedy... She again, she doesn't even see herself to be black. It doesn't, it didn't even change or rock her in any way, shape, or form. When she was telling her partner, oh, by the way, I'm black, he just took it as a joke. And if I'm <laughs> being honest, I feel like if he actually yeah, was black, yeah, it's actually, let's just go a oh, whole that boyfriend. I can't even remember his name, he was so <laughs> whack. The way he, can, can we do the boy? It's the boyfriend. Can we discuss the boyfriend? <laughs> Everything else, it made sense. I know what you were working with. I know why you did it. But Britt, why? Why did you, why, <laughs> why, why did you bring him into the story? <laughs> I mean, honestly, that's the character I think to me is the most hateable, like the most kind of punchable in the book. I think more than Kennedy, like he's the person that you just want to like kind of shake a little bit. Um, but, you know, yeah, for that, I mean, I really, I thought about what Kennedy's life would be like and... Um, you know, is she somebody that like after being told she's black, is she going to like run far away from it or is she going to kind of run towards it? And she runs towards it in sort of a superficial way. You know, she she is dating this black guy and thinks that it will accrue her with some type of something, you know, is it going to like you're dating, you fall in love with, um, you know, I mean, <sighs> Like you fall in love with somebody, <laughs> you fall in love with somebody black and suddenly you understand blackness or like there's oh. some type of really kind of juvenile way that she's, there's some type of transference that's going to happen if she's dating this black guy. Um, and, you know, and he is, um, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, yeah, he's trash. I don't really know what else to say about him. He's clearly, he kind of like fetishizes her in a weird way and also... Yeah. Um, you know, there was a lot there that's on both sides. I think that is really gross in that relationship. Um, but, but yeah, but I, I, I liked the idea of Kennedy experiencing this kind of racial existential crisis while she is in this interracial relationship, which to be fair at that time, you know, this is like the early eighties. So that's not a super common thing that she's doing. Um, and there are some stakes to it that, that, um, you know, she gets a sense of. Um, but again, she's experiencing this in a really super, uh, sort of superficial way. Um, but I think that idea of her thinking to herself, well, could this be true? Could this not be true? I'll be able to tell if I, you know, have this relationship with this black guy that somehow there's going to be, you know, some essence of blackness that's going to awaken and, you know, that type of idea. 
Um, again, it's this really a centralized way of looking at race that I think is really common and particularly I think can be common in a lot of white people, <laughs> you know? So um, that I think that relationship was a way for me to kind of play with that a little bit of how misguided Kennedy is and thinking that her blackness will be either confirmed or denied depending on who's in her bed. Yeah, because the thing is, in contrast, you have the relationship that Jude has with Reese, and it was beautiful. Which I love. Like, Which to I be love loved that relationship. in that way, it was just pure, and it was honest, and it was just, I think, something that some people probably want would want to attain. So it was such a lovely contrast to see Jude being loved in, you know, every inch of her. And what I found really interesting was, despite the fact that Kennedy did not have any black friends, she had the cheek, the absolute cheek, to tell Jude that it's surprising effectively that Reese like liked her or was attracted to her. Oh and yeah. That, that really like I had to put the book down for a little bit. I was just <laughs> I just thought that beep, but I just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she she really she pissed me off. I think there were so many elements where Kennedy just pissed me off. <laughs> pissed me off. Yes. She just pipes at you with the nonsense like every <laughs> few pages. And you would hope yes. That, she didn't know her mum was black, obviously, but you would have hoped that at the very least, okay, Stella wanted to be a Karen call. But when she raised her child, she didn't have to raise her in that way. Yes. And yeah. Well, she so, I mean, I, I think well, I think that's part of that's part of what uh, I found interesting is that like all of these things are choices, you know. Yeah. Um the like they're are ways to assume privilege in a way that you don't have to weaponize, <laughs> you know, yeah. like you can pass into a more privileged status in some way um, and, and choose not to weaponize it, you know? And I had a friend who read the book and was kind of pointing this out about, about Reese in a way of like Reese is, there's no like toxic masculinity in Reese, you know, like he doesn't sort of as assume the worst of the patriarchy, you know, he doesn't embody that. Uh, because he chooses not to, you know, versus Stella chooses to embody the worst of white supremacy um, in a lot of ways and, and chooses to sort of pass it on to her daughter and enable it in her daughter um, in a way that I think for her makes it feel like her sort of cover is kept. The idea of, of performing whiteness in the way that she has experienced it, which has been very hostile and it's been very violent. To her, that is sort of what it means to be white. So that's what she has to perform and that's what her daughter ought to perform. Um, in order to sort of keep up this uh, this performance that she's embarked on, um, so I think that that's I think that that's sort of a lot of it uh, as far as the two of them. But I think as far as that fight with with Kennedy and Jude, I mean, to me also thinking about that relationship was like they are family, although they both don't know it. And I think one of the things about being related to people is that you know it's going to hurt them. There's something really intimate about that, you know? So she knows that that is the worst thing that she could say to Jude. And she knows that that is the worst thing that like that will really dig in her. Um, and that is, there's something like almost familial about that of knowing exactly <laughs> the worst thing that you could say to, to hurt somebody in that way. So uh, that was how I thought about that in that moment of that. She knew that that was sort of the trigger button that she could push. It triggered me. <laughs> Yeah, I think also an, another kind of thing to think about when it comes to this um, kind of conversation on passing and the fact that you have Stella passing as a white woman being married to a white man is she, she does it with a very wealthy white man. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't just pick up any average Joe and then pass. She passes with a man that effectively can change her life and does. And so... Just pushing on that, do you think that that was also a major factor in her deciding to take passing from stage one of I'm just going to pass a little bit to get a job and then to like stage 100, I'm going to pass to get married, change my life, change my friendship group, change everything about me? Because I can't yeah. imagine going through that anxiety, you know, worrying that, you know, when you have a child, are you going to have some throwback from way back when and the child's going to come out darker <laughs> than you expect? That <laughs> Stella said, oh, one of those Maury scenes when you know, <laughs> Stella said, I'd rather he thought I cheated with a black man rather than him know the truth that I am black. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, this. It's not it's like how much money does this man have? Like, I get he's got money, but <laughs> he's rich. Yes, uh, he's must be like, because I couldn't go through, or not to say I can't pass, but 
I'm not saying I would, but I wouldn't go for all that stuff to some broke man to just like to be living in a trailer or some like any average house. Like, yeah. I can't see her passing to just live yeah. ordinary life. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that there is a lot that Blake presents to her. I think that, um, you know, he is somebody, he's wealthy, he comes from family money. Um, so there's not just the wealth, but also just sort of the prestige of it all. Um, and I think there's that element of it. Um, the, the ways in which he can materially change her life, um, to what you're saying of, you know, the freedom that comes with wealth um, that he offers her. Um, and I think just the, the really to, for her, Blake is kind of a door to this fresh start that she wants. She wants to kind of leave her past behind and reinvent herself in this new way. Um, so I think that he presents a lot of those things, but I think a lot of her experience in passing is class-based um, yeah. as well as based in race um, because not, you know, she's only experienced white people as a black person and she's only experienced white people as a poor black person and, and only experienced this and as a poor black person living in the South. Yeah. Um, so her experience of what it means to be white is very different than Blake's experience of what it means to be white uh, or eventually her experience when they move to the suburbs in, in California. That's a very different type of whiteness than what she has experienced and witnessed. Um, so the fact that like his mom thinks that she's kind of white trash or, you know, this, this idea that even Blake gets kind of embarrassed by her. He thinks she's kind of doing too much sometimes. Um, a lot of that I think has, has as much to do with class as it does with race, which is the rich have a very different way of being racist than the poor, you know? Um, And she doesn't know that because she has never really encountered, you know, rich white people in her life until she becomes one of them. And then she has to learn on the fly how to do it correctly. And she's always doing it wrong. Um, And I think in the same way that like Kennedy's life, she, um, you know, she lives this kind of fake bohemian life, but she lives, you know, she's like a fake struggling artist because she knows that she can always go back home or ask for money, you know? So she yeah. like has this kind of slumming that she's doing sort of the reverse of Stella in a way. Uh, but it's a, it's the thing that she's only doing because it's, it's supported by her privilege that she has as a wealthy white, uh, a wealthy white woman um, that she knows that she can, it can be cute for her to kind of uh, struggle because she can always ask mom and dad for some money and they'll help her, you yeah. know? Um, so I think I was really interested in, in those ideas of, of, passing within class because I think class-based passing is something that we a lot of us do at some point in our lives you know um the idea of either whether you're hiding where you came from or the idea of having to kind of try to fake it till you make it um you know walking into a room and being like oh everybody here is fancier than you know all those kind of feelings I think there are things that a lot of us have felt from moment to moment um so I wanted to explore that with these characters as they're moving through through whiteness but also through wealth I think when you kind of come on the point that all of us kind of pass to a certain extent, I think I found that in the book. I think every character in the book passes, Reese yeah. to a certain extent as well. And I think what I loved about that is it wasn't this big kind of, oh, Reese is trans. It was so beautifully written. But yeah. it's just who he was. And you told the story and kind of how it came to be, but it was just done so, I want to say carefully, but I think it was just done in, in such a way that it was clear that you didn't want to make it a big deal. We just wanted to kind of people to understand the dynamics between Jude and Reese as characters, and I just I loved the elements of when they when they were with the girls, as you can call them, Barry and whatnot, and that friendship group that, that Jude had. But like she wasn't she didn't have her own girlfriends, she didn't have her own sister, but she had this sisterhood, as it were, with these people that really loved and protected her. So yeah. I just loved that element. There were so many different elements of the book where people effectively made family from situations. You know, Early doesn't have a family, and he makes one. Um, with Desiree um, Jude barely has a family and she makes a new one with Reese. and I don't really know for Kennedy I don't know what she's doing but oh, we're not gonna, <laughs> we're not checking <laughs> well I guess maybe she didn't think that she needed to make a family because she's rich you know she doesn't need to have anything because as you said she can go back to her mum and dad and just be like look yeah. I'm, I'm going to go back to uni now and or I'm going to I want to live here I want to go there I think you yeah. said that she comes back to um, the US when she spends all of her money you know, yeah. and, she, and she steals from her parents and it's not really kind of spoken about too much, probably because, is it really stealing when your parents have loads and loads and loads and loads? Yeah, <laughs> teeth even... is a teeth is a teeth. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, you know, I think, um, I, I mean, I think that, that idea of found family or chosen families, 
it's really interesting, I think, in a story about passing, because passing stories are often so much about the dissolution of family or the denial of family. Yeah. Um, and to me, the, you know, when you have a story that is, like, the conventions of the story are one thing, then they're, the conventions of them are also kind of the opposite of that, whatever the opposite is. Like, you can't sort of write about Black without writing about white in some way. So I, I felt like, you know, you're re- reading this story about Stella denying her family or, or sort of hiding from her family in one way. Um, but then I knew that the opposite of that was in these characters finding family. Um, so I really loved Jude. Um, you know, you see, you get a glimpse of what it's like for her to grow up in Mallard and, and how traumatic and violent it is. Um, and then the idea of her emerging from that and finding a community that is accepting of her um, and yeah. loving toward her. Um, and that her finding this relationship with Reese uh, in a way that she's never been loved by somebody, um, not like her mother, but like loved. She hasn't experienced really friendship um, or romance for uh, in that way. So, um, so yeah, I felt like, you know, there's that to me was kind of the negative space of the story about passing, which is yes. how do people find families? How do they create and, and reconstitute new families um, that don't necessarily require blood bonds uh, you know that there are limitations to blood but I wanted to think about people creating these bonds outside of outside of the sort of traditional um, I guess genetic sort of biological family yeah I think it's important because like Natalie is my sister like we grew up together I know. and there's like nothing really that could come in between us and we don't have like the same mom and dad but despite that she is my sister so I get that so reading the book and kind of seeing how people form relationships really it's just to do with who you click with and who's got your back and she's my rival yeah. so like I really saw like elements of like relationships I have with other people in those characters yeah quite good which I love now I want to switch gears just a little bit because I know we should talk about the book but I just want to ask you a question how does it feel to be a two-time New York Times best <laughs> I just feel like it is my job and my duty to gas black women up. So, hundred <laughs> percent. You're being very humble, like yeah, I wrote the book and it's about yeah. that. that. <laughs> Brit, talk your shit. How does it <laughs> be you? Not that one, but twice, twice, twice. <laughs> I mean, you know, it feels great. I think, you know, I had no idea what was going to happen when this book came out. Um, it. it sort of occurred to me about March or April that this book was going to be coming out during this pandemic. Um, I didn't know if bookstores were going to be open in June. I didn't know if people were going to feel like reading at all or have the energy to read anything um, because we've all been experiencing this, this uh, you know, generational crisis. <laughs> um, so I really didn't know what was going to happen with the book. Um, and, you know, there were some encouraging early signs that we were getting good media and, and people were seemed to be excited about it, but I just had no idea what was going to happen in this this crazy moment that we're all living through. Um, so to debut uh, at the top of the, the New York Times, uh, this was something that I had never imagined. Um, I had never once, uh, I had never once thought that would be possible for myself. Uh, so it's all been just completely surreal. And, and the fact that I think that the excitement for the book has continued throughout the summer, um, that it hasn't, it hasn't dropped off. I think that's the surprising thing because usually like your first week, okay, that's the best you're going to do um, because that's all the pre-orders that have led up to your book coming out and people who bought it the first week. Uh, so usually that's kind of your peak, you know? Um, and I expected that. I thought, okay, well, this is amazing. We debuted. Um, at the top and this is the highest it's going to go and we're going to plummet after this uh, but that's not what has happened so I think all around it's just been mind-blowing um, and, and deeply surreal. I think it is so well deserved I remember we were Very saying well deserved. advanced copies and by dialogue books we've got her arc copy which I think Natalie you've got the copy of the book if you just want to show it. Which one? The Vanishing Half. No, know, yeah. copy. I've got like loads. Yeah, I know. Me too. <laughs> the dialogue, that one, the Dialogue Books one. So this one was sent by, to us by Dialogue Books. It's like advanced reader copy. And I was getting on a train, so I've got quite a long commute into London. And every time I get on the train, there'll be random women with the book. So you knew that it was sent to them by the publisher. And then I would just be like, you've got the book too. I've got the book. <laughs> And then everyone, how did you get the book? And I'm like, oh, I run Black Girls Book Club. And, and then, you know, because it was like, it was a thing. It was like a badge of honour. And so yeah. many women had this book and we were just on the train. And bear in mind, we were meant to be socially distancing. 
<laughs> just, it's just like everyone was just in love with this book. I remember when yeah. I read the first page and straight away, I think I said this to you um, probably when we were talking, but it just gave me their eyes are watching God vibes. You know, like when Jamie comes back to Eatonville and everyone's like talking about her and straight away, I was like, this is a smash hit. And reading it, it just it reminds me of Dorothy West, who I love. It reminds me of Zora Neale Hurston, who I love. And I think it's very rare and very unusual to find a modern day writer yeah. who evokes that. And I think I do a lot of reading women from the past who kind of, despite the fact that we're kind of years and years kind of between us, they get it and they feel the vibes. They understand what we're going through. So have you, yeah. and you're quite young, you know, writing these stories, it's just phenomenal to me. Like you just have... That magic, the kind of the way that we uplift the writers from the past who we've lost, and maybe there are periods where we didn't even know they existed. You know, those times where we, we just didn't know about them. To so have you, for me, is amazing. Like, I'm whenever I, wherever I go and people ask me, I'm like, Britt Bennett, Britt Bennett. So if anyone knows me, you'll know it's every day I'm screaming, Zora Neale Hurston. I think it's like my job. I'm like, I'm her PR in the UK. Going <laughs> you, bad. Wherever I go, I'm like, Zora Neale Hurston, you have to read this book. But yeah. I say their eyes are watching God is one of the best. Then the vanishing half too, and I always slip in the mothers as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't have time to talk about the mothers, but um, I love that book. So, yeah, guys, if you haven't <laughs> ordered that book, go and Maybe. go and make your purchase. Don't mess about. Don't well, waste time. Don't hesitate. I'll say, when it comes to Brit, the way Brit writes about family, the way she writes about the relationship that you have with your mother, it's on another level. There is nobody doing it like Brit does. So, if Thank you, you have the mothers, oh, seriously. <laughs> Don't be like me. I had me and Natalie. The way we were searching to get a copy of the mothers before Charlotte. No, the way you were searching and all oh, now you didn't get me a copy. I've got three <laughs> copies of the mothers. I don't have one. I don't one. have one. And I've got another one. <laughs> This you know when someone says buy something and they're like, I was going to buy you one, but I didn't. So they're like... <laughs> it's in my mum's house. So you are more than welcome to go to my mum's and say, can I have... I tell Auntie Dawn I'm going to get in my car after this and okay. make my way. <laughs> go and get them. But I'm telling you, guys, if you've just come to Please. find it through The Vanishing Half, I'm telling you now, read The Mothers and just... Please. When we're talking about writers, we always go back to like the Jane Austens, like the, the writers from back in the day that really just made us fall in love with reading. But I will tell you, I had a real tough time during this corona. Yeah, it was tough. Finding something to read. And every time I put up a book, pick up a book, I'll put it down. Like Natalie and I are writing our first book. And even sometimes like, I can't do it today. But The Vanishing Half, it just, it reminded me why I love reading. So thank you so much. Thank and you. I really appreciate that. Time, I know you've got something you wanted to read to the people. Yes, please. So, and just to say sure. to everyone, um, I can see your questions. Don't worry. After we finish the reading, we're definitely going to go through some of the questions. And if you haven't sure. submitted questions, please submit Stop them now. Yeah, I'm going to read a really, really tiny part so we can get to the questions. Um, so this is just from the opening section of the book, and it introduces you to the town where the book is set. It was a strange town. Mallard, named after the ring-necked ducks living in the rice fields and marshes. A town that, like any other, was more idea than place. The idea arrived to Alphonse de Sore in 1848 as he stood in the sugarcane fields he'd inherited from the father who'd once owned him. The father now dead, the now freed son wished to build something on those acres of land that would last for centuries to come. A town for men like him who would never be accepted as white but refused to be treated like Negroes, a third place. His mother, rest her soul, had hated his lightness when he was a boy, she'd shoved him under the sun, begging him to darken. Maybe that's what made him first dream of the town. Lightness, like anything inherited at great cost, was a lonely gift. He'd married a mulatto even lighter than himself. She was pregnant then with their first child. And he imagined his children's children's children, lighter still, like a cup of coffee steadily diluted with cream. A more perfect Negro, each generation lighter than the one before. Soon others came, soon idea and place became inseparable and Mallard carried throughout the rest of St. Landry Parish. Colored people whispered about it, wondered about it. White people couldn't believe it even existed. When St. Catherine's was built in 1938, the diocese sent over a young priest from Dublin who arrived certain that he was lost. Didn't the bishop tell him that Mallard was a colored town? Or who were these people walking about? Fair and blonde and redheaded, the darkest ones no swarthier than a Greek? Was this who counted for colored in America, who whites wanted to keep separate? Well, how could they ever tell the difference? 
By the time the Veen twins were born, Alphonse de Sor was dead, long gone. But his great, great, great granddaughters inherited his legacy, whether they wanted to or not. Even Desiree, who complained before every Founder's Day picnic, who rolled her eyes when the founder was mentioned in school, as if none of that business had anything to do with her. This would stick after the twins disappeared. How Desiree never wanted to be a part of the town that was her birthright. How she felt that you could flick away history like shrugging a hand off your shoulder. You can escape a town, but you cannot escape blood. Somehow the Veen twins believed themselves capable of both. And yet if Alphonse de Sor could have strolled through the town he'd once imagined, he would have been thrilled by the sight of his great, great, great granddaughters. Twin girls, creamy skin, hazel eyes, wavy hair. He would have marveled at them. For the child to be a little more perfect than the parents, what could be more wonderful than that? I'll stop there. Oh, perfect, perfect. So, some questions. Okay, so you have a question from someone called DM, which I really like. And it says, the passage of time was really interesting. How did you plot that? I love the book and I'm now ordering your debut, The Mothers. Yes, DM, order The Mothers. You don't regret <laughs> it, but passage of time, that's a really good, that's a really important point. Yeah. How do you understand um, that? Yeah, it took a while. I think that was the thing that was hardest to figure out was how to move through time because it quickly became apparent to me that this book was not chronological or that's not the way that it felt right to tell it. Um, so it took a while to think about it. I knew that I always wanted to start with Desiree returning and, and, and you guys brought up there as we're watching God. That's what I thought about, the idea of this woman who has returned from someplace mysterious and everybody wondering why she's back and where she's been. Uh, I just love that convention and in, in the literature. Um, and um, so I knew I wanted to start there. Um, and then I, then I start to think about, you know, when we were going to see Stella and, and whether that was, we saw her right away or whether that was delayed or whether that came, you know, I'm thinking about those things. Um, but then later as I was working on the book, I also realized like I was curious and going beyond kind of the bounds of what I originally thought the book would be. Um, sort of restricted in time. I was thinking, what are these characters, what are their lives like in the 80s? What are their lives like in the 90s? Um, I, I began to think about them in that kind of uh, longer glance at, at time. Um, so a lot of it was just about trying to figure out how to move the reader through time in a way that wouldn't be confusing. Um, a lot of that was my editor helping me um, and a lot of revision just over time figuring out, you know, that's why we eventually put dates at the beginning of sections, which was just like one very basic way of orienting people. Um, mm -hmm. But there were things like that of figuring out how can we move through time in this non-chronological way that doesn't confuse people. And it took a lot of work and, and effort to try to figure out how to do that. Mm. So we've got a really quite good question from Kemi. It's quite a popular one. And Kemi says, one thing I really loved about the book was, was that Stella and Desiree's daughters seem to have the personality of the opposite twin. Was this an intentional plot point? And do you think that the twins themselves saw this? Yeah, I mean, I wanted them to be very different from their own mothers um, and to have that kind of indecipherability of, I can't figure, like you you came from me, but I cannot figure you out. <laughs> Um, so I knew that I, you know, that Stella's daughter would be more outgoing and that Desiree's daughter would be more shy. Um, and, and I wanted the daughters in some way to kind of remind, uh, to remind their mothers a bit. Um, but I think, I, I think that Jude reminds Desiree more of Stella than Kennedy reminds De uh, Stella of Desiree, if that makes sense. Um, I, I don't think that that is, they like equally remind their mothers of each other, but I wanted them to, to be, uh, more like their aunts because I, I, I found that a way to kind of draw those sisters together, even though they were physically going to be apart. So it's something that kind of so have to see that sort of psychic pull of them being drawn together. And, and also it's a source of tension because you have this, this child who's nothing like you. And now what are we going to do with this relationship? Which I think is true of many mother-daughter relationships, parent parental relationships, period. Okay. So Lizzie P says, I have about 50 pages left and I don't want it to end. Sis, I know that feeling. Reading Della's story about passing over, 
how much do you think this desire was to pass down is down to intergenerational trauma from seeing the lynching as a child and wanting to protect her future children? And thank you again for this incredible book. That's, That's, what a, question. That's a brilliant question. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think, I definitely think that there is a, um, urge to protect herself. Um, yeah. that feels stronger to me than an urge to protect her children. Um, just because I think at the point in which she makes this choice, she's so young. I don't, I don't know that she's thinking about those things then, you know, um, I don't know if she's thinking about, uh, thinking that deeply into the future of what her, what her the experience of her child could be in Mallard. Um, I think that she really is in, you know, like I said, fight or flight, kind of that instinctual reaction um, to to having seen something that was deeply, tra not only deeply traumatic, but also just incomprehensible because it doesn't yeah. make sense. There's no explanation yeah. for it, you know? And I've had people ask me, like, explain. And I'm like, there is none. <laughs> Uh, why do black people, why are black people murdered all over this world, all over the time, you know, all the time, there is no explanation for it. Um, I, I wish that I could tell you something logically that would explain why something like this happens. Um, but really my explanation is close to Desiree's, which is that these things just happen. Um, so I think that that's really insufficient to, to Stella because she's a very logical person and she can't make sense of why this thing happened. Um, and uh, and I think that's something that really haunts her and definitely drives her. Uh, I think to me, it was interesting because it, it drives her away from Mallard, which is the site of this trauma, but it also drives her towards the community that traumatized her. And to me, it was something about that tension that I found really, uh, really complicated and really interesting. Okay. Um, and I have one question, which I really love as well. Guys, thank you for such good questions. So both this book and The Mothers have such a grounded sense of place. Have you ever lived in the places in these books? Or if not, like, what is your approach to researching and planning to get such a deep understanding of these places and the community around them? Yeah. Especially in The Mothers. Yeah, so The Mothers is set in Oceanside, which is where I grew up. Um, so there was that feeling of writing about your hometown, um, after you've left it, because I haven't lived there since I was 18. Uh, my parents don't even live there anymore. So, um, so I think that that was kind of writing towards, uh, my own memories growing up there in a way. Um, and I think as far as this Maui book, my mom is from Louisiana. Um, and excuse me. So I was writing a lot towards her memories of living there. She also left home when she was about 18 or 19. Um, and has lived in California for uh, most of her adult life. Um, so I was writing towards sort of her childhood memories of being in Louisiana. And also did some reading of, of these really small insular Creole communities that exist there that um, are very obsessed with color, maybe not as much as the people um, in Mallard are, uh, but are certainly very uh, color obsessed. Um, so I did some external research in that way. I don't think I did any research about Oceanside just because I grew up there, but um, but I did do some for, for the vanishing half to kind of construct this place from my mother's stories and from her memories of growing up in Louisiana. Yeah. And so we've got, we've got five minutes left. So I'm going to do one more question as well is, um, who are your favorite authors to read right now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, a lot I'm thinking of, I mean, my mind was going towards sort of all-time favorites, but I think yeah. to, read, to read now, that seems also a bit more contemporary. Um, but as far as sort of contemporary writers, I love um, Jasmine Ward. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, I really love Dorothy Allison. Um, uh, I love Maggie Nelson. Um, I, uh, as far as sort of all-time favorites, yeah. um, you know, I think all of this, people that everyone loves. I love Toni Morrison, I love James Baldwin, um, yeah. Zora Neale Hurston. Um, you know, I, uh, I love the, the Color Purples, one of my favorite books. Um, you know, d lots of lots of different writers. Um, I think there are a lot of really exciting um, Black women writing now, um, also in particular. Uh, I read the new Yad Jassi book, which comes out soon, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was great. Um, Luster by Raven Leilani, which is a really exciting debut. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of exciting people writing right now. 
How does it feel to have your name? So when we talk about Toni Morrison, we're talking about James Baldwin, people are now saying Brit Bennett. Like, how does that feel? <laughs> she doesn't believe us. Like, she doesn't believe I us. Like, I she... don't. <laughs> He's like, I don't. Like, <laughs> like, like, there is, there are levels to authors, and there's kind of like this, this kind of thing. When you say Toni Morrison, people you know automatically what you mean. So if I say to somebody, well, if you like Toni Morrison, you like Brit Bennett, then it means something. You don't connect the two, and because people cuss you out. Can you imagine if I if I recommended your book and they're like, oh, it's not that crap. Kind of like, <laughs> they're not trash, but you know. But so it's like when everyone who has read this book has gone wild for it. I've kind of been a part of so many different book clubs. Bear in mind, I have my own book club and all the other book clubs are doing this book. Like your name, we put you next to Tony Morrison, the James Baldwin's, Zora, you know, Alice Walker. This book is that. I remember when we met with Charmaine, the first time we met her and she said, look, you need to do The Mothers. And we didn't know, we didn't, hadn't heard of this book. You couldn't get it in the UK. The way Natty and I had to contact bookstores in the US. Well, you contacted them, remember? Well, I'm not going into it. Mean, I, like, I, like, we're right, so I like to bring you in. I contacted them. <laughs> I contacted them and I was like, please, I beg of you. And we got these Send me a copy. We got this book sent out for this event they were doing. It took forever to come. We were scared they wouldn't come in time. And you know when someone says, oh, the book is really good, but the way Charmaine was raving about this book, I was like... <laughs> Calm down. I'm like, is it even that deep? Like, come on. <laughs> you just said all that anti-climax. When I was blown away. And then when she told us, and she told us quite early that, that she had got this book, The Vanishing Half, and she said, I can't tell you about it, but I want you to know. When I read about, when I heard about it, I got the manuscript, I stayed up all night and I read it. That book, she's like, that book was going to be mine. No matter, I was going to get that book. <laughs> yeah, she, she loves books. Like, that's why we love Auntie Charmaine. She's our mentor. We love her to death. And when she tells you something, you just... Best believe it. You best believe it. But the, when she told, this is the one book where she was just like, no, girls. No, I'm not like, playing. Oh, I'm being serious. Let's take you out to dinner. Let's celebrate this book that I can't tell you much about, but it's Brit Bennett. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing she could have said that would have prepared me for what this book is. This book is a classic. And it's very rare that you can come out and say a book is a classic, you know, when it's only been out for a few months. This book yeah, is yeah. You guys Thank are, you. You're lacking. Come on, hurry up, read the book so we can do another book club in it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. It's so kind. And I've been grateful for Charmaine's support um, and for, for bringing me out to the UK, finally, uh, virtually. Uh, but the book is there. Um, and I'm hoping that I can visit actually in person soon. And, and Yeah, don't worry. We'll talk, talk to, to you. Yeah. <laughs> We do book, book club I'm just looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <Let's> celebrate. <laughs> okay, so I think we are coming to the end of the session. It's been an absolute um, pleasure, privilege, and pre- pleasure to um, to have you. And Melissa, do you want to say anything? I just want to say thank you. I think Nancy yeah. and I, when we founded the book club, we did it for one sole purpose: it was to bring Black women together. But even more so we kind of looked at kind of the state of publishing in the UK and we said, yeah. they ain't doing much for black women. So me and Natalie, we don't know anything about publishing. All we knew is that we knew that we like books. So we, we said, love we, books. We love books and we read and that's what we do. And we just said, look, what we're going to do is promote and amplify black voices. And that's just been our thing. And one thing I'll say about black women, you don't make it so easy because it's just book after book after book. And there's <laughs> only levels after levels after levels. After levels. levels of beautiful books that we get. And I think people are always saying, like, can you recommend a black writer? I haven't read a book by a white person since 2016. <laughs> I predominantly, and I only read books by yeah. black, black women. It's women. true, actually, and yeah. my life has completely changed. The way I view myself, the confidence I have within myself, the way that I, I even treat my friends, there is something to be said by trusting in and believing in black women. And I just want to say thank you for this book. So... If people are kind of in a position where they're not familiar with black writers or, you know, black women writers, start with Brit Bennett and then yeah. you know, work your way through. But thank you. And, and thank I just you. want to say that you will finish both this book and The Mothers in like two to three days, because once you get into it, you won't want to put it back. And literally, it just flows, like literally like water for chocolate. It just flows. <laughs> thank so, you. So, you know. Even in quarantine, Thank you guys. I'm, I appreciate stressed, it. I'm still reading this. But no, we can't wait to have you over in the UK in the can't flesh. Wait. Yes. Um, and we can't wait to continue to witness the success of this 
this amazing, amazing book. Thank you. Amazing Thank book. you both. Thank you guys so much for the support. I love what you do. Um, and it's such an exciting time, I think, to be a Black woman writer. So thank oh, you for yeah. your support. Um, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks. Yeah, and many thanks again to Edinburgh University, University of Edinburgh for sponsoring the festival. Bye. We'll see you guys later. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.